Welcome back to the golden age. We have another amazing special guest here today. We have Monsieur Sébastien Renier joining us all the way from Whistler, British Columbia to tell of his regales of the transition he's made to a new and interesting sport, as well as recount some of the great times he had with Bison Sports. So welcome to today's episode. Cool. Thank you. Um, very excited to be on here. You know, I... To be honest, until you emailed me, I didn't even know this was uh, kind of a, a thing. So I'm really excited to be part of this and excited for the interview and kind of, yeah, tell, tell my story, I guess. So you went, so we were chit- chit-chatting a little bit before we started recording here and you played hockey and then also did track in high school and then kind of had to decide which fork in the road, you're, which, which direction you were going to take when you reached that fork in the road. What made you decide to do track when you went to U of M? Um, well, I was a goalie in hockey and, um, I obviously I was a sprinter in, in track. So I was doing both for about three years in high school. They kind of overlapped and I'd been playing hockey almost my whole life at that point and loved hockey a lot, but I mean, making teams sometimes are, you know, I guess team sports were sometimes a little bit more political about making teams and it was a bit more a challenge, I guess, in that sense, whereas track, I was like, I was a good goal, goalie in hockey, um, but I was that much better at track. Like I was running provincial championships and stuff in high school and I had a scholarship offer as well for track, whereas I didn't have that for hockey. Um, I had a pl- chance to play junior, but I was like, well, I'm not necessarily getting my school paid for. I actually would have to pay for more hockey <laughs> and instead of getting money. And then, you know, so I was like, you know, what? I'm going to do, I'm going to stick with track. So that was, uh, Logically, I think it wasn't a crazy big um, decision for me just because I was doing both at the same time and they overlapped for a couple of years that I could kind of see a transition. Um, but another big reason, too, is my sprint coach at the time, or, well, my potential sprint coach, um, who was my coach for about four years, five years um, at U of M, was Alec Gardner. And he um, was honestly, like, probably one of the biggest influences on me going into the program at U of M because he only well, coached at, I think, three Olympic Games. Um, and I, there's hardly any other schools in the country that had a coach in their on their staff that went to one. Um, so I think that was a no brainer for me. And he was honestly, we're pretty good friends now. He's about, uh, 60, 50, 60 years older than me. <laughs> um, but we've got, we got so close. I, you know, I think he was, he was a really big part of that decision for me. What were some of the most memorable moments you had when you were a track athlete with the Bisons to- um it was a lot um there's all the little things just like even just like training with training with everyone honestly I mean that's you know we don't compete that often through the year we compete from January to March and almost every weekend so for nine ten weeks straight almost there's competitions but for the rest of the year we're just training really and then the same thing with outdoors but most of the time together with teammates is actually training so all the little moments of just having fun and training um, or not having fun and training, but we're at least all dying together. Then, you know, <laughs> we're not alone in that. Um, even in and obviously the moments of just like competing and hitting PBs are always really, you know, it's, uh, it's a feeling that if you could sell, you could sell for a lot of money when, when you do things right and you nail it, you're like, wow. Like if it's, yeah, one of the best feelings in the world, just nailing something. Um, but honestly, probably the best memories I've had is just like, Friendships that I made, um, being named captain after my second year, so I was captain for about four seasons, um, which was awesome, um, getting to know everybody on the team. And especially my last two years, winning back-to-back Canvas championships was amazing. Um, winning a U Sports medal last year was awesome. And I think it's, yeah, it's mostly just like the friendships that I made. I know it's cliche and, you know, cheesy, but to be honest, it's like I, I those are – the six best years of my life um, so far. We'll see. But so far, it's it's been amazing. Um, and like just the friends I made along the way, it's it's been, yeah, it's pretty special. So definitely would have to say that. The U of M track team has actually had a, a, you know, no pun intended, but an amazing track record through most of the program's history. What was it specifically that you think that Alex did to set the standard and create a culture of success with the track program at U of M? Um, well, bef- I know he had like two stints. So he had a stint in the, I want to say seventies, I may be wrong, but seventies, eighties, where apparently he was a real hothead. And he would, apparently if guys didn't hit their splits in the relays, he'd throw his 
stop watching against the wall and smash it and <laughs> yelling at everyone. And then by the time his second the second go around, um, he was kind of like Mr. Miyagi. Like he was just he knew everything about everything there is to know about sprinting, really. Um and just also like managing different types of athletes. Cause I think we're all a little bit weird in our own way. <laughs> and uh, he was really good at managing and like kind of directing us so that we could do the best that we individually could do. And in set, like, but also he would, I mean, in our sprints group, at least, um, we were just really tight. We were really, really close. And it seems like one of the big things that I loved about U of M and like our team is that individually, every training group was really, really close together which is nice because it's an individual sport, but it's nice to see there's so much camaraderie and like so many friends in their own training groups. And then even when we all got together as a team, there was no disconnect. Everybody kind of intertwined and still was really, you know, people were really friendly and really good friends, even though we're like the biggest team on campus by far, like we're like 130 every year. Um, and only about 50 ish get to travel. So obviously not the whole team gets to travel, but the whole the team as a whole was very close and then obviously the traveling teams were super close too so it was um i know going back to friendships but i think it's just like for such a big team to still come together and be that close i think was something that like really whether it was directly related to alec and our group or claude and his group or other ming and the jumpers i think each coach kind of like led their own group really well so that we could kind of all come together and be just as close with people that didn't necessarily directly train with what do you think was the most challenging part of the time that you spent as a sprinter with the Bisons? Um, COVID, honestly. I mean, I feel like that's probably the answer for a lot of people around that time. Um, when things were good before and after COVID, they were good, right? Like it was just like sometimes you got to get through really hard workouts, which sucked. <laughs> um, some some time spent by by garbages, that's for sure. But in terms of just access to facilities and training was definitely during COVID. We were extremely fortunate enough that like track, at least sprinting or even distance running, like the running part, you could do that just about anywhere, right? In COVID, you could go to parks, you could go right on your street if you wanted or go to the track. Like at the time, I think there's only U of M rubber track. Now I think there's two or three more in the city, which is kind of nice. Um, but at the time there was just U of M. And so sometimes you could kind of sneak on there I think it, we, we weren't allowed, but I think some of us still did. <laughs> um, just sneak on there. We were still able to do some stuff um, in the summers and the springs outside. And in the winters, it was it was tough. Like, I remember, like, for me, it's I'm a sprinter. I had a treadmill at home, like, at a home gym. But the treadmill only goes to about 12 miles an hour. So I could max that thing, and I wasn't really running hard at all. <laughs> so... It, I never really got to actually full speed training. So I was doing a lot of trying to do some type of tempo lactic work where I was doing longer runs and Alec would still send me some workouts here and there. And thankfully also like Adam Stevenson, like our, our strength coach, he sent us kind of on or um, at home programs. If we had, those were grueling. Those were really, really hard just because we, no one really had like, obviously no, like hardly anyone has like Olympic weightlifting, um, like platforms, plates, and like a squat rack, racks, whatever. So like I had a bunch of free weights. We had a bow flex and stuff. So I could, it was a lot of like smaller exercise that he would send, but just like a lot of reps. And it was looking back at that. I was like, I did that. I grinded that for like a year and a half. I don't think I could do that again. <laughs> Cause I think the hardest part was also like, it said, like it just, you weren't training with anyone, right? Like there wasn't like when you're dying, you couldn't kind of just, you know, mess around with your friends and just, take your mind off of it while you're not in the middle of dying and just like kind of like get away from it. And it was just like, no, it was a lot of like lonely, I think lonely times. Um, and so that was honestly like the biggest challenge for me because I'm definitely a big social butterfly. And I like interacting with friends, teammates and whoever's around when I'm training. Um, so I'd say, yeah, the, the year and a half that we really had when we couldn't train in the facilities at, at U of M was, was definitely tough. Well, I'm sure that the way you might be able to look at it now is, whenever you're faced with scenarios where you are isolated or where you don't have a bunch of people around, you know that if you've been able to push through it before and not even that could stop you, then what else is possible? Yeah. And I mean, like, even just like moving out here to Whistler, it's like my first couple of weeks, like we, the, the rest of the national team, since I'm, I'm living here now, 
and I'm working here. The rest of the national team, not all of them are like living in Whistler for the, for the winter. Um, they're all getting in next week. Um, so for the first like, couple of weeks, it's been kind of adventuring on my own. I have, I have a couple of teammates that live in the same building as me that work with me. So like I have a couple of guys to kind of get along and I have a cool roommate from Sweden. So he's kind of fun to hang around. But in terms of training still, you know, I've been on my training sessions so far. I've been kind of alone, but it's it's so pretty out here that it doesn't feel as lonely. It's not, I'm not stuck in a small room with like a small, small gym with no windows. It's like, Oh wow. Okay. Cool. I'm running in a nice soccer field with like a mountain, a couple mountains around and the sun's shining. Anyways, it's, it's, it takes the, it takes the mind off when you're, I guess, surrounded by, yeah, just a good place. So it, if I could get through that small home gym, I think I'll be good for, for the rest of it. Hopefully. So what was it that made you want to transition into the next sport and how easy or difficult have you found it? Um, well, years ago, like it was, uh, it was kind of a pipe dream, not necessarily that I told myself like, yes, I will be doing this, but, uh, there was a program called RBC training ground and I did it for my, for my first time in 2019, um, at, they actually held it at, or the Winnipeg one, um, at Max Bell. And basically it's kind of like a combine to identify, I guess, the next generation of Olympic athletes. And they had like standardized tests. Um, so I did it first time in 2019. Me and my brother were both randomly contacted by ran, uh, Rugby Canada. I was like, okay, cool. We'll entertain this and see. And there's supposed to be another wave of testing in Regina. But somehow I think there was like administration um, kind of uh, backlash going on in Rugby Canada at the time. So they kind of just ended that pretty quick. And I was like, okay, well, whatever. And then in 2021 during COVID um, still at the time a little bit um, there was another round of RBC like it happens every year for RBC training ground but 2020 didn't happen because of COVID and so in 2021 um, I did you kind of did your own test remotely you had to film all of them um, and me and my teammate at the time Luke Delo we kind of both did it together um, in Max Bell and then we both actually got picked as like the top 100 athletes in the country and we moved on to the final and you know we were looking at the different sports um because there's specific like national sport organizations that look into kind of picking athletes or i guess funding athletes that they believe could you know take part of their program and go to the olympics and years prior bob said and skeleton were part of this um so me and luke were kind of joking like yeah it'd be pretty cool to like you know get picked by bob said and skeleton and like you know and there's even like a, a tsn interview after we were done um our testing at the final and we were both kind of just just messing around like yeah they're pretty cool like you know get caught, like do scouts and bob so like i feel like they're pretty sick and um you know just kind of joking like you know not really thinking thinking anything of it um and at the time me and luke probably like we crushed it like we both individually were like i think top five and like all of our of our speed and power tests the endurance tests we struggled a bit more but we're not endurance athletes so that wasn't really for us um we didn't get picked as the top part of the top 30 because it was mostly endurance sports that uh, we're looking to pick athletes and Bob said Bob said and skeleton weren't actually part of that that year so it's like oh darn you know like it would have been cool but I guess man too bad I just kind of went on with my life and then so that was kind of the first idea that I was like okay maybe you know that'd be kind of cool to switch to that and um this year after my indoor season my now coach Rob Elchuk um who kind of took over after Alec retired last uh last fall um told me he just straight up told me he's like you're gonna do skeleton after and i was like what so yeah no, no no this i'm getting you the contact this is what you're doing it's like okay and so rob is like another world-class coach um he's coached like multiple multiple world record in para sprinting paralympic sprinting um and then he's coached two skeleton athletes two olympic olympic medals um one from the uk and one from australia uh, like you do like speed and power work with them. So he wasn't like their sliding coach, but their sprinting coach basically. And so me knowing that and me hearing him say like, yeah, you're going to do this. I was like, okay, I have pretty good confidence that, and you know, you have good authority in getting me to do this. And so um, gave me the contact that he had from the national team. Turns out it was uh, Joe Cicchini, who's actually the head coach for my team now. I didn't know that at the time. Reached out to him. I was, they're based out of Calgary in the summer. So I was in Calgary for a track meet and he said, just come by after and have a session posting a sled just to, you know, give it a shot and try it out. Um, Cause he was kind of, we were talking back and forth. He's like, you're already faster than all the guys we have here. So 
we just need to get you pushing a slide and we'll see how it goes. And on the first day in like an hour after being like dead from all right races, I hit their second highest like national standard for funding with this, like the push. And I was like, Oh, okay, well, this is a good start. And he told me, he's like, yeah, this is kind of get close, but like, you know, we can maybe take you to the Olympics in three years. I was like, okay, that's <laughs> not something you hear all the time. So that'd be kind of cool. But then I kind of realized I was like, Oh, well, I just got accepted to a master's of physio at U of M something that I've been working for, for ever since I got into university, really. Um, and I kind of realized, well, I kind of have to make a decision between staying home, doing school, still sprinting as much as I can, you know, because I, I, I'm a busy body. I don't want to just sit there. I'd still want to do sprinting if I, if I could, um, or kind of uproot my life, move to Whistler, do something I've never done before. <laughs> um, a sport that I never competed in and, give that a shot and well here i am so kind of decided you know what it's a once in a lifetime opportunity i can go back to school um whenever you know i got into my first try for physio so i i would hope that i could get it on my second um i can be a physio for my whole life i can't necessarily be an, an athlete for my whole life so i thought screw it let's do it and i have not regretted it at all since and i haven't really even got into it yet so so far so good that's exciting man it's definitely one of the one of the interesting crossroads that people will face in their life especially those who are athletes and when you have the opportunity to continue or to do something else it really leaves you feeling paralyzed like is this the right decision yeah. am i just trying to be a glory cowboy or is there really something here that could change the course of my life in ways i can't even see yet and i think that you made the right decision at least based on the logic that school's there and you can do it when you're 30, 40, whatever, but you can't be pushing a sled when you're four. Not that you can't, but it's a lot harder to be pushing a sled once thing, you yeah, get older. Not right? of the same capacity. And like you said, like it was like after I got back from Calgary and I was home for a day and then went right back and we were gone into Ontario for like a week for more meets with a bunch of my teammates. And I was kind of talking with my teammates just about this and, you know, Every single one of them just all told me, like, what are you doing? Why are you debating this? Like, what? <laughs> like, they were almost all like, is this a joke? Like, why are you even thinking of not doing this? Like, the hell go. Like, go. So I think they they helped me a lot with kind of, like, realizing that. And also with Rob, same thing. I, I got back from that trip and told him, like, you're not going to do it. He's like, nice. That's That was the plan. Okay, good. I was like, what? <laughs> yeah. So anyways, it's um, – I'm glad that I had my friends kind of push me in that direction because it was – at first, I'm I'm not a huge risk taker. I'm not one to just like switch my mind and change things. Um, so honestly, like if anything, this really opportunity kind of showed me like, oh, I guess I'm with anything in life. I guess you can kind of just, you know, go take your shot. Do do something you haven't done before because like why not? A hundred percent. That's a resounding message that a lot of people hear, but not a lot of people execute on because. Yeah. The scary thing is that all the magic of life that you are looking for is always on the other side of something that you don't want to do and that has to do and that contains a lot of uncertainty. Exactly. So yeah, I agree. There's no other way to find out what this path is meant to teach you in life other than to actually go and, and take it. Exactly. Yeah. And Honestly, it was also kind of like always a pipe to your mind. Like, oh yeah, I've always wanted to go live in the mountains. Just like live in the mountains, work and, you know, still stay fit and kind of work out whatever. And then I was like, ah, another life. I guess I can't really do that now because I'm, you know, going to physio school, which I was perfectly fine with because I was like, I'm really excited to get into physio and I've been wanting this for a while. And now I'm actually doing that little pipe dream that I had, except on like a even cooler level because I'm competing for a national team. And again, like I said, hopefully going to the Olympics one day. So this is a... Uh, 10 times better than I'd imagined, really. Well, it's been great being able to chat with you today and to learn about how Bison Sports has impacted your life, your athletic mm -hmm. career. And I'm very excited to see where you get to take this opportunity next because it's something that it truly is once in a lifetime. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for joining us on today's episode. It was great to have you chatting with us and look forward to all the great success that you will have on this journey, pushing us lead.
Thank you. Yeah. I mean, again, I'm not just pushing, I'm sliding and I haven't done too much of that yet. So I got to still learn how to not die <laughs> sliding down an ice track at like 150 kilometers an hour ish. Um, so, but yes, thank you. I was really, it was fun doing this and, um, yeah, look forward to chatting with you another time.